Maybe I'm innocent or maybe I'm ignorant, but I did not expect so many fart jokes in a play written 2,500 years ago. What is going on everybody? My name is John Solo and it never fails to amaze me how deep the well of Greek mythology goes. We've been talking about this stuff for three years now and not only am I still constantly learning about new stories and connections between characters, but I'm straight up discovering deities I had no idea existed. For example, a few weeks ago, we talked about Asclepius, the god of medicine, who's already not very popular among casual fans of the mythos. And while breaking down a play that he was featured in, I came across not one, but two gods whose names I'd never read before, which is incredible considering how fundamental they were to Greek society and the human experience as a whole. Their names were Plutus and Panea wealth and poverty, and today you're gonna learn everything there is to know about them. Before we get into it though, I've personally gotta welcome Plutus and stave off Panea. So let me tell you about this week's sponsor, Upstart. In this episode, we're learning all about the gods of wealth and poverty. And while each figure is fascinating in their own right, it goes without saying which one we would all rather hang out with. Thanks to Zeus blinding him though, it's basically pointless to pray for help with personal debt and other financial woes. That's why I'm excited that we're partnering with Upstart. For a lot of people, being financially healthy doesn't mean being rich. It just means shedding the burden of credit card debt, which Upstart can help you pay off quickly and easily with a personal loan. Here's how it works. Unlike other lenders, Upstart considers more than just your credit score. They use your income, current employment, and other info you put in your application to see if you qualify. The whole process is done online, and in just five minutes, you can check your rate for loans between $1,000 to $50,000 without impacting your credit score, and you can receive the funds as soon as one business day. Those funds can then be used however you see fit, to pay off credit cards, consolidate high interest debt, or just fund personal expenses. So if you wanna join the million others who've used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date, either hit the link in the description or go to upstart.com slash John Solo. That's upstart.com slash John Solo. I hate to start the section off this way, but I've got some bad news for you, Solo fam. If at any point in your life you prayed to the gods to make you wealthy, be it through the lottery or your career, those prayers fell on deaf ears. Well, I guess that's not totally accurate. They were heard, they'll just never be answered because Plutus, the god of wealth, is blind and has no idea who or where those prayers to him are coming from. Sounds like a pretty weird attribute to give to a god, right? Well, let me start from the beginning because there is some logic to it, even though it is kind of evil logic. So Plutus, the god of wealth, is the son of Demeter, the goddess of agriculture, and the hero Eosian, who, as the story goes, met the goddess in a field that was plowed three times. According to Homer, Eosian tried to make a move on Demeter and was immediately murdered by Zeus's lightning. But another variant by the Cretan writer Petalides says her fate was similar to the field they met in. The second of those two variants is what led to the birth of Plutus, wealth, who in sculpture form was always depicted as a baby, but curiously in vases, he was painted as a young man holding a cornucopia, which symbolized abundance and nourishment in the form of fruits, grains, and nuts flowing out of it. See, when Plutus first came into existence, his domain was specific to agriculture, wealth that was cultivated from the ground, hence the cornucopia filled with crops. But as time went on, even more riches from the earth fell under his influence. Valuable resources like precious gems and metals were suddenly his for the taking. I'm happy to say that despite how easily these riches came into his possession, Plutus stayed humble and grounded. He had no desire to hoard the wealth for himself, nor was he going to allow evil, dishonest men to exploit loopholes in the system and be rewarded for it. If it were up to him, the only rich people would be the just, the wise, men and women who have honor. Sounds pretty great, right? Well, Zeus didn't think so. He feared that with how much mankind valued wealth, they would start to make their sacrifices to Plutus exclusively so they would get rich, which meant the other gods would be left hungry, thirsty, and powerless to do anything about it. I mean, they could probably go out and hunt for their own food, but they had domains to watch over. Sacrifices were supposed to be their payment in exchange for keeping the universe from bursting at the seams. So what was Zeus's solution? How did he make sure that Plutus would never have more power than himself and that wealth would always be distributed randomly and without merit? He emitted a flash of lightning and blinded the poor guy. 
Kind of like how I just did to anyone watching this video in a dark room. Since that dreadful day thousands of years ago, people all over the world have wondered, why are my sacrifices never repaid? Why do I do so much good for those around me just to be left with nothing while evil bastards receive all the rewards? To some folks, it seems like poverty. Pania is a clingy mistress that just won't stay out of their life. So let's talk more about her and where she comes from. I'm pretty disappointed to say that I came back from my research binge on Pania mostly empty-handed. Though that is actually appropriate when you consider what her domain is. There just isn't that much written about her. That's no doubt partly due to about 99% of ancient Greek texts being lost or destroyed over the past two millennia, but I believe that another contributing factor was that artists back then didn't want to invite Pania into their work or their lives out of fear that she would never leave. After all, Pania wasn't your typical deity. In the words of the Greek poet Theogenes, everywhere her status is inferior. Everywhere she is scorned, and everywhere she is equally hated. No one wanted to be blessed by poverty, so no one made sacrifices to her, making her as poor as the humans that she would attach to. In fact, the only reference to worshipping Pania that we know of was found in Philostratus's Life of Apollonius of Tyana, where he mentions there being an altar to her in the city of Gadara, where, quote, the inhabitants are excessively given to religion. So, since almost no one wanted to think about, much less write about Pania, we don't know too much about her backstory, and the stuff we do know does not paint her in a flattering light. For instance, in Plato's Symposium, he creates a dialogue between the great thinker Socrates, the playwright Aristophanes, and a few other notable figures from different walks of ancient Greek life. Throughout the dialogue, they sing the praises of Eros, the mischievous god of love, and share a pretty horrifying version of his conception. On the day of Aphrodite's birthday feast, Pania showed up to the party on Olympus, despite not being invited, and started weirding out all the guests. She was lingering around the entrance, begging for morsels of food and sips of ambrosia from every who passed her by. Naturally, everybody ignored her or turned her down because it was uncomfortable to even look at her, but her patience did prove useful. She spotted Poros, the handsome spirit of expedience, passed out drunk in the garden and decided she wanted to have his babies. So she curled up next to him and you can figure out the rest. According to Plato, it was the union of poverty and expedience that led to the conception of Eros, but there are many other writers that give him different origins. So if you want to learn more about those, check out my video on it. The only other myth where Pania makes a physical appearance is a comedy written by the aforementioned Aristophanes called Plutus, named after the god of wealth. We talked about it briefly in my video on Asclepius, but due to the unique subject matter and genuinely hilarious dialogue, I thought it'd be cool if we took a closer look at it today and examine the arguments it makes for the necessity of both the rich and the poor. Some fascinating background info about the play before we start. The man who wrote it, Aristophanes, was known as the father of comedy, and his works are classified as the oldest of the three kinds of Greek comedy, new, middle, and old. In total, he wrote about 40 comedies, but only 11 have survived to this point, which in my opinion is a real shame, because Aristophanes has been credited with capturing the daily life of ancient Greece the most accurately, and we could have learned a lot more from his works. Not only that, but with 29 plays lost, that means we're missing out on at least 100 ancient fart jokes, and you'll see what I mean by that soon enough. So when the play that we're discussing today opens, we're greeted with a scene where an Athenian man named Cremilus and his slave, Cario, are following some random old blind man as he walks down the road. They don't know for what purpose they're following him yet, but when Cremilus went to the Oracle of Delphi to ask why he's lived such an honorable life only to end up poor, she told him he must follow the first man he sees after leaving the temple. And so he did. Well, initially, that blind old man wants nothing to do with the master and his slave, and when they ask him his name, he threatens to thrash them. But when they respond by saying they're going to team up and throw him off the edge of a cliff, he walks back his earlier threat and reluctantly reveals that he's Plutus, the god of wealth. Yet for some reason, Plutus takes on a different form in every medium that he's portrayed in. I mentioned earlier that as a statue, he's shown as a baby, and in paintings, he's a young, handsome fella, and now here in the play, he's a dirty old man. After learning that he was talking to the god of wealth, Cremilla says that he's not going to let Plutus go, which is exactly why the god didn't want to reveal his identity in the first place. But Cremilla says, no, you misunderstand me. I'm a much better person than anyone else you're going to run into. Although I did just threaten to throw you off a cliff, that was a joke. I'll make sure that you're safe from harm and I'm going to get your sight restored. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal, but Plutus is skeptical and understandably so. Zeus doesn't take kindly to people who get in the way of his punishments and Plutus doesn't want to end up in a worse 
worse position than he is now, but once again, Kermilis uses his way with words to convince him otherwise. And what he says here, I find really interesting. He hypes up the concept of wealth and lists off all the great things that come from it. People's desire to be rich leads them to create inventions and beautiful works of art. Wealth motivates blacksmiths and artisans to stay late in the shop and keep crafting the weapons and wardrobe that their community needs. Wealth is what gives a king his pride and makes people listen to him, and armies with more funding are the ones who always win. Now obviously, these are not all completely accurate statements. Pride and motivation can come from plenty of places outside of the desire to be rich, and smaller militaries can absolutely topple larger, better equipped ones if they employ the right strategy. But the fact still stands that wealth is a powerful fuel for many aspects of life and therefore Plutus would have a lot of power over mankind, possibly even more than Zeus. And after being told this, Plutus is suddenly open to hearing Cremilus' plan to cure his blindness. After they arrive at Cremilus' house, he invites Plutus inside, but the god says that's never ended well for him. Rich men have imprisoned him to keep his wealth, while poor men have robbed him of everything he had on hand and booted him back onto the streets. I really like the distinction between the behaviors of the different social classes here, showing that the rich man is more intelligent, more future-oriented by keeping Plutus captive over the long term, while the poor man is impatient, short-sighted, and only robs him of what he can in that moment. That obviously would not apply to every single rich and poor man in the real world, but in the context of the story, you could see how the different mindsets got them into their different financial situations and use that to influence your own behavior. Anyway, Cremilus eventually gets Plutus to come inside, and the next scene shows Cario speaking to a group of local farmhands, the people who Cremilus plans to make rich after curing Plutus. He's trying to hype them up, but it's pretty clear he doesn't have much practice at it because he says, Master is brought with him a disgusting old fellow, all bent and wrinkled, with a most pitiful appearance, bald and toothless. Upon my word, I believe he is even circumcised like some vile barbarian. Then he says something along the lines of, by the way, that disgusting old man is Plutus and he's gonna make us all rich. All we have to do is cure his blindness. And it's here that Cremilus joins in and says they should take him to the temple of Asclepius to do that, which everyone agrees to. On that note, Plutus, Cario, Cremilus, and his friend Blepsidemus set out for the temple, but they don't make it very far before the ragged, rotting goddess of poverty emerges from the shadows and tells the men to freeze under penalty of death. Now you might expect our Athenian characters, Cremilus, Cario, and Blepsidemus to immediately cower in fear and bow down with respect while in the presence of an angry goddess, but you'd only be half right. They cowered in fear, not because she was a goddess, they thought she was a wine shop keeper or egg woman, but because she was so ugly. After she reveals herself to be Penea, Blepsidemus tries to run away, crying out that poverty is the most fearsome monster that ever drew breath but Cremilus convinces him to stay and then questions why the goddess is so upset with them. She says, why am I upset? You're trying to heal Plutus's vision so he'll give money to the poor and drive me out of Greece. To which the Athenians respond, well, yeah, but you're the worst. At this, Penea vehemently disagrees. She says that she'll prove that she's the sole cause of all of mankind's blessings and that it's wrong to make all just men wealthy. If she fails, they can do what they like to her, and Cremilus picks out the punishment of 20 deaths to the loser, wondering aloud how many it'll take to kill a goddess. To summarize Penea's stance, she basically says that without poverty, no one would be motivated to work. If Plutus just went around rewarding people who are honest and just despite them not providing a good or service, then no one would want to hammer iron build ships, sow or farm. Why do anything when you can be paid for nothing? Cremilla says that's a ridiculous concern because they'll still have slaves to do all the work. Now, he's not as forward thinking as you thought, huh? But Pania points out there won't be slave traders in this new world. After all, it's a dirty business and good men won't find it worth it to put themselves at risk for such dangerous work. Cremilus then retorts that good men are already living in misery, using stones as pillows and eating mallow roots instead of bread. But Pania argues that he's describing beggars, not poverty. Poverty gives you just enough to keep going, but never enough to get comfortable. She also hilariously adds that poor men are smarter and more fit because they have to use their mind and body to get along, while the rich become fat, lazy, and dumb because everything they ask for is just handed to them. If people knew what was good for them, they wouldn't run from poverty. They would thank her for making them strong and giving them a reason to keep going. 
Now you may think that she's raising some good points, but Camillus isn't buying into this romanticized view of poverty. As someone who dealt with it all his life, there was no way he could be convinced that it was a good thing, which means Pania was fighting a losing battle from the very beginning. So at a certain point, Camillus just said, I've heard enough. Go hang yourself and don't breathe another syllable. I will not be convinced against my will. Even if you are right and I do want you to come back someday, you can spend every moment until then locked in jail, banging your head against a wall. After this, the goddess runs out of the scene wailing like a banshee and Blepsidemus chimes in to say he can't wait to feast with his wife and children and fart in Pania's face. Then the four men head to the temple of Asclepius to accomplish their mission once and for all. So considering that we already talked about the scene where they take Plutus in to be healed in another episode and it doesn't add anything to the whole poverty versus wealth theme we've got going on, I figured I would just skip that part with the exception of one detail. See, while Asclepius and his attendants were making the rounds that night, curing each of the sleeping sick of whatever ailed them, Cario couldn't help but notice there was a pot of stew in the communal area and he was really hungry. The problem was that no one was allowed to be awake at that point, so he very sneakily had to fill his bowl with stew, gobble it up, and get back into his sleeping position before anyone noticed. He almost pulled it off too, but as he got back into bed, his stomach was overwhelmed with the bucket of stew that he just shoveled into it, and in the words of Cario himself, he let out a thunderous fart, which we're specifically told did not smell like perfume. Maybe I'm innocent or maybe I'm ignorant, but I did not expect so many fart jokes in a play written 2,500 years ago. Outside of that, all you gotta know is that Asclepius is successful in giving Plutus his sight back and the god of wealth immediately feels guilty for associating with wicked men while the good ones were being neglected. At this point, we skip forward an undisclosed amount of time and Cremilus is the big man on campus. Plutus is still living with him and as a result, his home is overflowing with food, drink, and luxury. I'm happy to report that he was a man of his word as well. Cremilus shared his wealth with his peers and after a lifetime of piety, honorable men all around Greece were finally getting what they were owed. Hell, even the slaves are doing all right. They have enough gold to treat themselves every now and again. Many of their masters are so rich that they have no problem sharing their fine foods with them. And maybe the best news of all, instead of having to wipe their asses with rocks, they now use garlic stalks. Yeah, somehow that's an upgrade. Maybe they were made by Charmin? Charminopolis? The final act of this play is used to show us how the world turned out after honest men were awarded while evil men were punished. And they do this by having random civilians from Greece appear at Camillus's door and either thank Plutus for his help or curse him for taking away their wealth. Only the guy who showed up to curse him doesn't fare very well. The fact that he lost his wealth is proof enough to Cario that he gained it through evil means. So not only does Cario not care about this formerly rich man's plight, he punishes him even more by robbing him of his shoes and clothes. Another pedestrian who shows up is an angry old woman who says that before Plutus made good men rich, she had a young man who would visit her to ask for food and money and he would always flirt with her and make her feel beautiful. But as soon as he was wealthy, he told her he never wanted to see her again and banned her from his house. The most notable of the disenfranchised visitors has to be Hermes, the messenger god himself, who tells Cario to gather his master, his master's family, and all his pets because Zeus wants to, quote, serve them all with the same sauce and hurl them into the pits of Tartarus. It turns out the king of the gods' initial fear about Plutus came true. Humans who sacrifice to him can buy anything they want, so they aren't making sacrifices to the other gods, which means they're starving for nourishment and power. Cario doesn't have much empathy for them though and says, the Olympians want a sacrifice? I'll give them one right now. Ah, <sighs> in honor of Zeus. And no, I did not make that up. A bold move for sure, and you might be surprised to hear that Hermes was so desperate, he didn't even get offended. Instead, he asked if he could work for Camillus and got a job setting up the next Olympic Games. These ones in Plutus's honor. After this, some more time goes by, Zeus ends up giving in and joining the nonstop party that's happening at Cremilus's, and the play ends with a group of formerly destitute fanboys escorting Plutus to his very own temple. Now, I think it's safe to say that this comedy would not be considered canon to the Greek mythos. It's more of a Greek mythology what if than something to be taken seriously, like Hesiod's Theogony, which details the creation of the universe. That being said, I do think it provides some pretty insightful commentary about people valuing wealth over all the other incredible things our universe has to offer. Now, in the case of the play's characters, that does make some sense, considering we mostly focused on old men who were poor their entire lives despite working tirelessly day after day. So when they suddenly became rich, it felt well-deserved and they were fulfilled. 
But I do think Pania had a point in some of her arguments, like how for some people, it's that fear of losing everything that causes them to not just work, but compete and innovate. Sometimes it's necessity that drives creativity. An example from my own life would be the messed up origin series. I was just about broke, had one month of rent money in my bank account, and literally would have been evicted only a few days after Christmas if the first three episodes of messed up origins didn't catch fire when they did. The thing is, I realize how lucky I am, and I don't want to misconstrue my point. I'm I'm not saying those who have enough shouldn't be charitable. For reasons we'll never understand, the fates have spun tragic futures for many who don't deserve it. But if the opportunity arises, I think we should all take a page out of Camillus's book and share our wealth with the community. That is at least what I got out of the play, but I'm eager to hear your interpretation. What do you think was Aristophanes' reason for writing this one? And which side of the Plutus vs. Pania debate do you find yourself leaning toward? Let me know in a comment down below. Then if you feel like this video taught you something and you want more content like it, hit those like and subscribe buttons. Those who want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news or behind the scenes content would be wise to either follow me on social media or join our Patreon and Discord for a measly $1. And anyone who needs some eye bleach from all the toxicity on social media nowadays, give my pups a follow. I promise Penny is very private about her political opinions and almost never brings up the ethics of factory farming, so you'll be safe from all the hot button issues. Hey Penny, who'd you vote for in the last election? See what I mean? I'll see you all again next week in an absolutely massive episode of Norse Mythology Explained. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.